deep within the Pentagon, within the dark corners, past the crevices, past the things that watch from the shadows, down below the center is an item from the Department of Defense that is at the heart of military procurement. It is an instrument that guides the military through the threats of modern warfare and helps them come out alive. It is, of course, an onion. But not any ordinary onion, no. It is the survivability onion! <clears throat> Hello there. Welcome to my TED Talk, where we're going to answer some questions about who is Ted, where is Ted, um, why doesn't Ted show up? Wait, hold on. What the heck is this? That's the wrong script. Oh, hold on. Don't need those pieces of paper anyway. Um, so. Oh yeah, onions. That's what this one is. Okay, so. Good, we got that in order. So as you've probably guessed by now, this is a video about the concept and slideshow of the survivability onion. A decently popular PowerPoint slide from the Department of Defense. There are some other ones that I think should be a little bit more popular just because of the sheer insanity of them, but this one was easy enough to understand to kind of spread through culture. As a disclaimer, I'm not really sure if it is a part of military procurement, but it is mentioned a few times in documents related to the doctrine of the Navy and the Air Force. The effect on the Army and Marines, I'm not so sure about, but I do believe it would have at least some bearing on them. I think it's kind of a interbranch thing. I could be wrong. I'm not really sure about that part, but it does look at least slightly complicated. Don't let that scare you. It's not nearly as complicated as it looks. And compared to other Department of Defense slideshow slides, It's pretty stinking simple compared to that gibberish. What this video is going to cover specifically about it is first explaining the levels, and then after that, giving some examples of how the levels can be utilized or what different types of systems will go into each one. The first classic layer is don't be there. Now, US military doctrine for air power and sea power revolves around this concept pretty heavily. You don't need fancy countermeasures or armor or need to be fast and maneuverable if you aren't there to be shot at. Long engagement distances and being able to fire at targets beyond air defense range are key here. This layer is kind of a, the king layer. It is more important than anything else. If you have an artillery gun, for example, if it doesn't have to be there within combat range, then it does not matter if it can survive a tank round if there's almost zero possibility for a tank round to actually be fired at it. Now, onto the layer of don't be detected. It has a very similar effect of the layer of not being there, but it's a little different. Let's say instead of being outside of the country, you are now inside the country. But not being detected means don't give them any reason to think that you're there instead of not being there. If done correctly, you will be just as survivable as if you were not there at all. It's mostly signature reduction. Don't be on your phone. Don't have active radars. Don't have active IR searchlights, that type of thing. Things that give the enemy a sign that you exist kind of all fall under this category. Do not do them. And there isn't a whole lot to be said there. This is the part of the onion that people start to disagree with each other on, however. We're getting on to where some people say acquired, some people say avoid targeting. Um, we've got another onion here that says don't be acquired that also lumps that in with it being engaged. And really you can lump a lot of things together in this category. What I'm going to lump in this to, into this category is we're going to go over the concept of at least the basis of the concept, that is, the enemy knows you exist, but they currently cannot either fire at you or pinpoint you. That can be anything from hiding behind a brick wall to having a very small radar cross-section, hiding in a building, hiding behind cover. All of these things kind of fall under this type of umbrella. And really, there's two schools of thought there. You can either stab the enemy's eyes out, or you can go with the route that is more like hiding from them. You can destroy radar installations, you can destroy listening posts, you can get rid of drones, or you can make it to where those listening posts won't, posts won't hear anything, 
you can make it to where those drones can't see you because you're camouflaged. And since there's not really a whole lot of consensus on this one, I'm going to move on to the next three that people can very much agree on. Now we're getting into the part of the onion that I think is probably the most important if you are on the ground being engaged. Now, all of these next ones lead to each other. If you're going to be engaged, that means you're now being shot at, basically. If you're being shot at, the longer you're shot at, the more likely you are to be hit. And the more likely you are to be hit, the more likely you are to be penetrated. The more likely to be penetrated, the more likely you are to be killed. And it kind of starts the downward spiral into dying hor a horrible death. So, if you can, and if you have any method possible, don't be engaged anymore. Let's say you were hiding behind a tree, and they could not pinpoint you, they didn't know exactly where you were, and then you popped your head out. They see you now, you're now engaged. They start firing at you. That's a pretty stinking big problem. Ways to get out of being engaged would be one of two things. You can either just deploy smokes, run behind cover, retreat to a more tactical location, get outside of range. You can use a you can use concealment to your advantage, or your other option is to shoot them with your gun. This can be anything from suppressive fire and just throwing as much lead over there as possible to keep their heads down and not firing at you or assaulting their positions and making sure you take them out as quickly as possible so they can't shoot at you anymore. Make it to where they either cannot shoot at you or are way, way too dead to shoot at you. You can be aggressive or you can disengage. That's up to you and in the situation. But you want to limit the amount of time you are engaged as much as humanly possible. Staying mobile is also key. When you stand still, your chances of being hit go through the roof. And that is all stuff that you can do. Now, on the topic of equipment, what could be the person that's engineering your new IFV or tank do to avoid getting hit? You can make it mobile. You can make it to where it has a smaller profile and is harder to actually hit with any projectile. You can make it to where its signature return is low enough that it's hard to actually get a lock on with missiles if it's a plane. You can add on countermeasures like active protection systems. You can make it to where it can launch flares or decoys or jam signals to make it to where anything fired at it has the lower chance of actually hitting it. Now what if, let's say in this imaginary scenario that we have here, you're being shot at and you get hit. Things go in a very uh, tactically disadvantageous position, or as I would like to say, you've gone straight from the freezer into the burning pits of hell, as when you're hit, what you do no longer becomes nearly as important as how much the person designing your vehicle or equipment cared about your life. If you're infantry, being penetrated, you don't necessarily have a whole lot to stop that. You may have your plate carrier, but if it goes through the plate carrier, your layer of the onion has failed. If you're in a tank, that's a different story. Now, let's say you're in a tank and there's a machine gun. Can the machine gun kill you? No. Why? Because it cannot penetrate you. Can the machine gun engage you? Most definitely. The machine gun can hit you a whole lot, but it cannot penetrate you. Now, let's say you're a tank and you get hit by a tank round. There's not a whole lot you can do to avoid it penetrating after it hits you. It happens very, very quickly. It's all in with your equipment. That comes from explosive reactive armors. That will also come from having thicker armor, passive reactive armor. Really not getting penetrated is just making it to where whatever hits you doesn't have the opportunity to enter and then kill you. Just have it being hit with stuff that's ineffective. The main problem with that is if you are being hit, eventually something from somewhere is probably going to penetrate. Now let's say you, being the unlucky person that you are in this imaginary moment, you have been transported to the combat location, the enemies knew that you were there, they saw you, pinpointed your location, and started to engage you. You were then hit, and then you were penetrated. This looks like a few different things. We're moving on to the area of trying not to die once you're penetrated. Let's say you're an infantryman, and you're being shot at, and kaboom, you've been shot. And you look down, and you see your leg. You've been shot. Congratulations, you did not instantly die. That's good. Have you failed or succeeded on the don't die spectrum? No, you have not succeeded or failed. 
You are currently bleeding, bleeding a lot. First aid, field hospitals, that kind of stuff is what's going to save your life now. You're kind of in the middle. Your objective is to not die. You want to have be in the place where you have to do nothing to actually stay alive, other than eat and drink and all that stuff. Tourniquets, first aid, you know, that those things. Uh, if you're infantry, it really depends on luck whether or not you die or not from being shot. You could be gone like that, or you could be sitting there with possibly missing an arm or just having holes in you, and you survive. And maybe you even get your arm back, luckily. Some people get their arms back, you know? Apparently losing your arm isn't permanent in some cases, which is probably a testament to modern medicine at this point. But when it comes down to being an infantryman, it's probably the part that you don't want to be in. Being hit and then having it stop in your plate carrier, yeah, that's going to hurt, that's going to suck. But as soon as it penetrates the plate carrier or hits a spot where it can just, you know, penetrate your skin, life sucks real bad. When it comes to other parts of equipment, I say equipment like infantry is a piece of equipment, but an infantryman is not a piece of equipment. For pieces of equipment like ships, tanks, aircraft, th those sorts of things, it's not as cut and dry. Let's take a tank, for example. The tank round hit. None of the armor was effective enough to stop the round, and it has now entered, let's say, the fighting compartment. Having a design of the fighting compartment that makes it to where bouncing around is not as bad, having blow-off panels, having automated fire extinguishers, that type of stuff is pretty good. Having the hatches big enough that if a fire starts, so the ammo begins to cook off, the crew can get out, or if the vehicle is disabled, like it's the engine, the crew can also escape and start fixing it. That is kind of the stuff for don't be, don't be killed. A lot of the time, if you're penetrated, there's a really good chance that the vehicle itself is killed, and we move on to saving the crew. For some vehicles, some, of, some being Russian vehicles, at times, not all of them, but there are a few that fit this type of category, that once the vehicle is down, the crew is down too. A lot of Western vehicles don't necessarily follow this type of thinking. Sometimes Western vehicles will sacrifice the entirety of the ammo storage to make sure the crew can survive with the blowout panels. Although they're not on all of them, and it's kind of hard to see that divide sometimes. Things to keep the vehicle running, those would be redundancies, or having parts on the inside that are hard to penetrate themselves. You may have gone through, let's say, the armor around the engine, but if you have a reliable engine, there may be a chance that you don't hit anything that in the on the engine that will knock the engine out. On an aircraft, if there's two engines, you can, can maybe knock out one engine, but the other one might be functional enough that it can still limp home. If you manage to take down the aircraft completely, the pilot has an ejector seat, and you can save the pilot. With how much crew, how much crew training matters and having vehicles be effective to fight in, I do see that protecting the crew is much more important than protecting the actual vehicle if it's penetrated. Again, if you're on a ship, or if you're in a tank, or if you're in an aircraft, your life is much, much better than if you are infantry and you're penetrated. Because there's a good chance that if your vehicle is penetrated, you might not be bleeding or dead. If you are infantry, there is a 100% that you are a chance that you are now either bleeding or dead because you've been hit and penetrated. Now for a minute, I also almost completely forgot about ships. If, let's say, your ship is hit by a big old torpedo, there's a few different things you can do. You have life rafts, so if your ship is completely doomed, you can get the heck out of there. You also have watertight doors and water pumps to make it to where the flooding becomes not too much of an issue. That's why some modern ships can have absolutely massive holes, yet stay afloat almost indefinitely because of their pumps and watertight doors. And that's why when ships don't have functioning watertight doors that are leaking a lot, they tend to sink more often. There's also automated fire extinguishers, there's fire hoses, welding equipment, there's all kinds of stuff on ships that can make it to where you can mitigate damage. There's also the design of having anything that is world-ending to the ship, like the magazine, the medical compartment, electronics, engines, sometimes command sections are put in the center of the ship and not towards the outside. You may have a massive hole on the outside perimeter of the ship, but if the in if the middle stays intact, you have a better chance of the ship staying afloat and not sinking, as it didn't hit anything that was important. 
If you're still listening, congratulations, you've gone through the boring part, and now we get into the fun part, explaining how all of this goes together. Now, something like the F-35 may be designed to not be there and not be detected, but it does still have flares. It still also does have a 20 millimeter rotary autocannon, which in most cases, it should never have to use either of those. But for all things, we run into a problem. Now, in hindsight, it's very easy to see where you are on the onion. But without good intelligence, there's the fog of war. It's very hard to know if the enemy knows you're there, or if they know where you are, or what you are, or even if they've engaged you sometimes. A good example of not knowing that you're being engaged is, let's say, the Gulf War, when Iraqi jets were taking off, and missiles were already flying towards them. They had no idea they were engaged, and that meant they couldn't make any action against being engaged or preventing being hit, penetrated, and killed. A good example of this is ambushes. Let's say you're in a tank, and you're driving down the road, you set up on a hill, and what you currently believe you're at is on the second layer of the onion. You know you're probably in a hostile area, but you don't believe the enemy knows you're there yet. And then all of a sudden... Where was he actually on the onion? Well, he was probably already on the engaged section at this point. He has no idea. And then the back of the turret gets hit, the jet goes straight through the ammunition magazine, into the crew compartment, and everybody dies. It's a very important to know where you are on the onion effectively so you can do some things effectively yourself. This is where intelligence comes in. If the enemy is very bad at hiding and you're kind of decent at seeing them, it's rather easy to know where you and your enemy are on the onion and you can almost always reliably be higher on the onion than they are. If the enemy is really good at surveillance and you're not very good at hiding, you have the disadvantage. You don't know if they know where you are, and you probably don't know where they are, meaning in almost every single encounter, they will have the advantage. This is why uh, reconnaissance is a really good thing to have. Climbing the onion is a bit like climbing a ladder. You can get the high ground by climbing that ladder. You want to be as high up as you possibly can be. And thinking that you're all the way at the top when you're not is very dangerous. A good example of how this all can go incredibly quickly is let's say there's an Apache helicopter and it's flying along and you are a man in a tank and you believe that you're not even in a combat zone. And the Apache helicopter gets a little close, sees you, identifies you, fires a Hellfire missile, which hits the vehicle, penetrates the vehicle, and destroys the entire crew. Most of those layers were removed in just a couple of seconds. The crew did not have time to use any type of disengagement or evasive action to avoid this type of threat. And that's where you need multiple different types of systems that can either detect the helicopter or counter the helicopter. And it lends to the issues with having one system compared to another one. That tank, in our first example, if with infantry support, likely would not have that issue. Infantry going into a machine gun would have much worse issues if than if they had a tank with them. The tank would probably have no issue against a machine gun nest. Other units are really what kind of fills in the gaps. And being knowledgeable on your place in the onion is probably the most important part. If you are trying to not be seen while they've already engaged you, or more accurately, if you're trying to not be detected when they've already engaged you, well, I'm not really sure that trying to avoid triangulation by not using your radio really matters when the rounds are cracking over your head. It's also another good thing if you are trying to compare things on a one-to-one -one basis, like tanks, you can add in things like optics. If you have a... Abrams tank, T-72. Can the T-72 penetrate the Abrams tank? It's actually likely. There is a chance that the T-72 will be able to kill the Abrams. But will the T-72 be able to see the Abrams? Most likely not. The Abrams is more likely to be able to see and then engage that T-72 before the T-72 knows about the existence of the Abrams. Thus, the Abrams has a design and a doctrine that can place it higher on the onion than opposing equipment. It's another reason why if somebody says the F-35 can't dogfight, they're actually correct. If you were to take a master's fencer and put that man in a sword fight against a U.S. Marine, the U.S. Marine would lose. 
but that is not a reason for all of the U.S. Marine Corps to be replaced with Olympic-level sword fighters for a very good reason. Marines don't sword fight. They shoot people. And when you can take a sniper rifle and take the head off of that master fencer from a few hundred yards away, it no longer really matters about your sword fighting capability if you can not even be close enough to be sword fought in the first place. An F-35 cannot dogfight, but it can, in most cases, fire a missile and hit you just as you take off before you know the war even started. For the answer of why something like the F-35 does have rotary auto cannons and also does have flares, fire suppression systems, and those whole thing, all of those things there, you can never be sure of anything. You can think you may not even be in a dangerous situation and a SAM battery may be just behind that tree line that nobody managed to pick up. Mistakes happen in any system or event ever in the throughout the course of humanity. No situation is mistake free. And while they're not going to put their entire while they're not going to put all of the resources possible into making sure that a SAM system can't hit a F-35, they are going to, at the very least, put some considerations into it, just in case. While the F-35 is designed to not be there, it also has an ejection seat just in case it has to be, or it is accidentally. The thing that I think is so good about the Onion model is it's a great way to show who has the advantage and ways to gain the advantage. And while there's, it doesn't show super well offensive capabilities, it does show the likelihood of loss compared to different situations. And by that, I think it's a valuable tool. But this video is probably longer than it should be at the moment. There's also the conversation of soft countering and hard countering. Soft countering is the first few layers. If you have a weapon system or you have a vehicle that, let's say, in a hypothetical situation, isn't there, then nothing can kill it. If it's not detected, nothing can kill it. Even if it's a weapon that can hit, penetrate, and kill, you can counter it with those layers of the onion. A hard counter, however, would be the hit, penetrated, and killed. Those are the parts that armor plays a really big part in, and why some systems are just invulnerable to some equipment. You'll have a tank, and its armor is good enough that nothing a machine gun can do will make the thing have its turret pop off, thus hard countering a threat. If your infantry and or your machine gun nest going up to a tank, there's no way that you can really protect yourself from being penetrated and killed. But if you can, you can get the heck out of there so where you are not either detected or engaged. Different types of equipment just have different types of things you can do. That's also why having multi-role equipment, like having a Bradley with a ATGM launcher and also with infantry dismount, allows it to do a large amount of different things. It's also another reason why multi-role aircraft have become the more modern approach to air power. The F-35 is not supposed to just attack aircraft. It's also supposed to be able to do ground attack. It's supposed to be able to run SEAD missions. It's supposed to be able to do a lot of different things depending on the mission requirement, so you don't need seven different types of aircraft to do different jobs. If you show up in a versatile vehicle, it lowers the amount of hard power the enemy will be able to leverage against you. They can attack with infantry, and if your vehicle has a machine gun, you can counter the infantry. If they attack with a tank and you have an anti-tank weapon as well, you can now possibly destroy their armor threat as well, meaning their hard power is heavily diminished. But that's been me. I've been talking for way too long at this point. Thank you all for watching my TED Talk about onions and fighter planes. I've been your friendly neighborhood coffee goblin. Editor, take it away. Hello, this is Editor Bitterlinks. Um, editing has been painful, especially in this one. I needed to get this thing done for a few weeks, and I could not get the motivation somehow to actually sit down and edit it. It's definitely been a trip seeing me go from 50 subscribers to 4,000 in a matter of what feels like a few days, even though I... Actually, no, yeah, it kind of did happen in just a few days, about a week. I, mean, I think I went to 2,000 in around five days after I got to, I think, 100 subscribers.
me and my family had a big celebration and with that and then all of a sudden things got wild i applied for monetization although they haven't monetized me yet and it's been a while and whenever i see a spike in viewership i just think man that could be so much money because you know programmer socks don't buy themselves and i need to get the code that i'm working on for cataclysm up and running so i don't pull my hair out if enough people ask what is cataclysm i'm going to sit down and make a review in six hours flat with the best editing i've ever done in my entire life just to show more people this incredible game the best game ever known to man as much as people disagree with me on it they're wrong but that's besides the point i am happy that i finally got it at least done enough that I will accept pressing the upload button. It was hard to get to that way. I'm pretty happy with all of the techniques I've learned on how to edit, especially for the beginning of the video. I think that intro is one of the best things I've ever, probably ever made in my life. For if you're a regular on the channel and you've gotten this far, hi. Um, I have school and stuff I still have to go to. It's an eight-hour drain on my day, and I at videos will come out slowly a month and a month and a half probably at most at two weeks at minimum if it's a small video and i'm working for a while on it i can't release videos very quickly but i'm going to try my best i am a i i think i'm a small channel 4000 doesn't feel very small but i released the other video at 50 so i'm i'm still a small hobbyist channel in my opinion that's enough of me talking. You've probably heard a lot of me talking, so you can get along with your day. Um, have a good one. Don't get murdered. If you get murdered, I suggest calling the police and getting the murder sorted out. Um, YouTube, if you're listening to this, could you please, like, finish the monetization thingy so I can get my money, please? Thank you very much. Um... I don't make any money right now, so I kind of need it. And also, it will make me make videos faster. But uh, anyways, uh, that has been me, not Kermit the Frog. And I will see all of you tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow. Goodbye, anyways. I'm pressing the stop recording button, so I stop talking.